Well, see the breakfast and plus TV Africa open about Nkotaria is on standby. He joins us via phone this morning. Nkotaria, it's good to have you join us. Good morning. Good morning, Nessie. Good morning, Nigerians. Yeah, good morning, open up. Well, let's good take morning. a quick... Yes, please. Uh, let's take a quick look at the leadership newspaper this morning. We also have the Puncher, the Nation and the Guardian newspaper. But I'll start off with the leadership. The leadership says... As insecurity in Northeast escalates, gunmen kill 37 police officers in 52 attacks. Emo records highest attacks, casualties. We cannot or we can't tell exact number of police killed. A boy in command is quoted to say. CSO's security experts blame situation on unemployment, marginalization, and hunger. Away from the board caption. Uh, Armed Forces Day President Muhammad Buhari, Governor's IGP paid tribute to fallen heroes. Uh, yesterday was Armed Forces Remembrance Day. There's also a pictorial representation of that event uh, on the front page of the leadership newspaper. Niger government condemns killing of Catholic priest attack on church. That's also another unfortunate and sad, uh, you know, incident that took place. Uh, if you see the picture and the videos. Um, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about this morning. President Mohamed Buhari congratulates Clem Agba on South Korean Award. And just before we move away from the leadership, 21 died, 95 injured in Bauchi Plateau Road accident. I expose Obasanjo's third term bid to Senate. Ben Obi is, uh, you know, proud to say. That's the much we can take this morning on the leadership. Away from the leadership, we'll move on next to the Punch newspaper. The banner headline for this morning, Bank Borrowing from CBN Rises 260% to 21.87 trillion naira. With a right that their lenders frequent central bank lending window post-COVID-19 as business activities peak up. Uh, there's a picture of their uh, story from the Armed Forces Remembrance Day celebration. Uh, what a caption there, widows demand benefits as federal government honors fallen soldiers. Google unveils portal for 2023 elections. Terrorist lynch, Niger priests abduct five Katsina worshippers. NBA president seeks constitution amendment, independent candidacy. Above the masthead of the punch, 42 COVID-19 infections recorded. Federal government rolls out restrictions. Oil earnings rise 363 billion naira in three months. 16 PDP supporters killed, 83 injured in crash. Now, government on plant uh, dishes out dangerous chemicals, threatens residents' health. Those are the major stories you can find on the front page of the Punch newspaper this morning. Uh, let's take our attention from the punch and uh, quickly look at uh, the Nation newspaper. The Nation newspaper says, in spite of constitutional provision, the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation is yet to publish the audited accounts of the federal government uh, for 2020 and 2021. Uh, it's, you know, on the top corner of that page there. Well, uh, very unfortunate. And people have constantly asked, you know, how far we have fared with impunity and lawlessness in our system. Tunubu rallies APC leaders, candidates for elections. It's boldly written on the nation, ex-governor or ex-Lagos governor, governorship and National Assembly standard bearers brainstorm. It's a rider you find underneath. Another says, kidnapping Amoteku firms up security in Southeast. And uh, petrol subsidy removal will unlock 11 trillion. This is according to what experts are reviewing in terms of our spending. Expert reviews spending. Well, very interesting. CBN's credit card takes off. And uh, we just, uh, Konoa, hopeful of salary payment. AGF request members details the headlines on the nation this morning. Away from the nation to the Guardian. Nigeria loses 8 trillion naira to FX arbitrage in three years with some riders there. Realistic exchange rate will add 4 trillion naira to Federation account in 2023, says Yusuf. Ex-CBN director is saying it's not intervention but 
outcome of regulatory control, among other writers there. Also, Buhari or Shibajo lay rates to mark Armed Forces Remembrance Day, that's on the uh, pink strip there. Bakari calls for a new breed of leaders. On the green strip, trim uh, 228.1 billion naira National Assembly budget or face lawsuit. Sarah threatens Lawan Bajabia Mila. Group expresses concern over Kano's worsening health. Other stories of Basaki visits 12 rescued kidnapped victims, hill security officers. Nigeria's energy transition mad by debt subsidies stranded. Oh, those are all of the stories you can find on the front page of The Guardian this morning. Okunabo Nkotara, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you once more. I'd like us to take a look at the leadership newspaper this morning. What are your thoughts? Uh, statistics and reports from the leadership talks about insecurity in the southeastern part of the country. Gunmen kill about 37 police officers and 50, in 52 attacks. How do you respond? Actually, the issue of insecurity in the South is becoming quite worrisome. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it's a deliberate attempt by the federal government to look the other way so that the South East will be uh, become a um, a pool of blood. Recently, we just had sadly too about the killing of a priest. That is so, so, so touching, where it took one full hour for these criminals who tried to raid or who tried to invade the premises of the priest, and when they failed, they bought it. One hour, and there was no response from security of papers. In the southeast, now they say how many policemen have been killed. Yes, it is sad. These policemen were trained by Nigerians and the taxpayers' money. But then, what of the civilians that are killed on daily basis? What has the federal government done? So, it is quite disturbing. I believe the whole essence is to prevent elections in the Southeast. They want to instill fear in southeasterners and all those residents in the southeast so that elections will not take place in that area. Sadly, we have a president that is doing nothing about it. I don't know if I should say it's also complicit. But this situation in the south, the insecurity, has reached its climax. Anything beyond this is a war. All right, uh, uh, let's uh, take uh, the security uh, situation one step further. Let's look at the, the armed forces. Yesterday was the armed forces remembrance day. Some of the papers captioned it in different ways. The leadership said uh, armed forces, the PMB governors, IGP pay tribute to fallen heroes. Uh, the poem says, uh, we does demand benefit as federal government honors fallen soldiers. Open about the 15th of um, January every year, uh, Nigerians, uh, the, the leaders that uh, they lay read, you know, to honor, as it were, the fallen heroes. But most of the times, when we hear the stories, uh, you know, from the, those they have left uh, behind, it is um, a harrowing experience. Uh, is it, would you say it's just mere lip service? Uh, the federal government is not so bothered or, or is not really doing the needful when it uh, comes to the welfare of uh, those people who have paid the supreme price, as in those they left behind. Honestly, honestly, I didn't hear you clearly. Uh, if you could just summarize it, please. All right, uh, the fallen heroes. Yesterday was the Armed Forces Remembrance Day. You know, would you say the federal government has done enough in terms of uh, what they need to do for those? Uh, they have left behind because most times it's always about laying wreaths and honoring them as it were. Uh, okay, I think I think I I I get your question now. The truth about it is that the federal government has not even done enough for the living, those who are still serving. The dead ones are forgotten. This issue of armed forces remembrance is just a ritual that has to be performed. 
and they go there and make all kinds of species and they leave and that's the end. If you observe the spouses of those fallen heroes complain, their widows and widows complain on daily basis how they have been neglected. In most cases, even the allowances or benefits or whatever are not paid to the spouses or uh, the widows or widowers. So the issue of remembering the dead is, is a fleeting illusion. I mean, no nobody, no president, I'm not, not just Mr. President Muhammad Obwari, it is not in the culture, not in our Nigerian culture. Most presidents will just go there, read out the speeches that have been written for them, and walk away. And these other ones, the survivors are left to their fate. We are even talking of the ones that are serving, believing, nothing is done. They don't even equip them. They don't pay their allowances and so on. And that's why these soldiers and these policemen always take the laws into their hands. You can see a policeman killing for just a hundred naira. You see a soldier, a captain, a major involved in armed robbery, involved in uh, kidnapping and all kinds of criminality. Because the federal government, I'm not trying to justify it, but because the federal government has neglected our heroes both serving and dead. So uh, this issue of armed forces remembrance there's just a yearly ritual that has to be performed. Not that they really have uh, the, the interest of the dead or even their survivors at heart. That is far from it. I'd like to share your thoughts on, you know, the unfortunate incident. I know you have mentioned it, uh, the, uh, you know, the incident where bandits born a reverend father to death. And some people have described this as barbaric, but uh, why is it that we haven't been concerned about the state of insecurity in Nigeria? Now, the federal government is complicit, and I'll tell you why. You remember the former service chiefs, I'm talking of uh, Burakai and Ko, if I have to be specific. So much was allocated, released to them to fight terrorism, banditry, and so on. Their successors came on board and indicted them by saying there is no justification for the money released. The NSA corroborated that story. And what happened? They were rewarded with ambassadorial appointments. A former inspector general of police was ordered by the CNC, Commander-in-Chief, I'm not just talking of President now, Commander-in-Chief, to relocate to Brunei, one of these states. Months after the Commander-in-Chief went to that state and was told that the IG never slept in that place, which, was a very, or which is a very serious offense in the military. What did the CNC do? He said, I will investigate. He went back and that IG retired served out his term as a general of police. When you have this level of impunity, what do you expect the people to do? This uh, is the man you are talking about, the priest. They said it took them one hour. They could not penetrate his house because he had raised an alarm that his life was in danger. Nothing, nothing was done. Now, because they could not penetrate, they burnt down that house. One hour, there was nobody, no security man, no security, the security operators were not there to intervene. And after the act had been done, you come out to say you're on top of the situation. On top of the situation, in a situation that you cannot reverse, you are talking of lives. So there is high level of complicity by the government. You know, the those of them in the those states, a deputy commissioner of police and a DSS uh, officer were arrested in Edo State. Why? Because the governor of Edo State insisted, ensured, because this crime, the kidnapping was uh, approaching a, 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 a frightening dimension in Edo State. And what did he do? He brought in men from the force headquarters. And by the time they investigated, a deputy commissioner of police 
and a senior DSS officer were involved in the kidnapping, and that was why it was driving. They were arrested. Now they, they go to Edo State. The situation is not as bad as it was. So it depends on the head of the government at any particular point in time. His level of commitment and level of sincerity. All right, uh, open up. Well, let's take um, another story on um, the Nation newspaper, which is actually uh, this issue of um, petrol subsidy. You know, this time around, uh, petrol subsidy removal will unlock 11 trillion naira expert reviews of spending. Well, this is coming in the wake of uh, where the, the, the federal government has earmarked, um, you know, so much money again this time around this year between January and June, you know, f to spend on petrol subsidy. What's your take on all of this, Obunabo? What's my opinion on subsidy? Petrol subsidy removal, yeah. <laughs> My dear brother, this is the same government that said there was no subsidy. Unfortunately, this is the same government that has spent so much on petrol subsidy. It's a fraud, it's not a scam. You have a cartel in charge of it. Which, and Mr. President, in this particular case, is ought to be directly indicted because he's the Minister for Petroleum. And he has failed working. And this was, in fact, as a um, serving military officer, he was petroleum minister. As president, he's still the petroleum minister. And look at the price of petroleum in Port Harcourt going for as much as 450 500 naira per litre. What are you subsidizing? We are they actually subsidizing? It's a cartel, it's a gravy trade. How much was it, has been invested in our refineries and nothing has happened? So much is being put in and nothing to show for it. We are still exporting crude and importing the refined products. It is unheard of. It has never happened in any part of the world before. Now you say you want to remove subsidy. Anywhere in the world, these products are subsidized. Anywhere in the world. But the difference is that in other civilized crimes, they ensure they reduce, if not eliminate, the fraud in subsidy. Now you say you're going to remove subsidy. It's going to have a domino effect because the market will increase our prices. The landlord will increase his rent. Uh, the car seller, dealers will increase the price of cars. Meanwhile, your salary is not being increased. What happens? Anarchy will set in definitely because Nigerians will react. So it's not all about the issue of subsidy. It's about the fraud in the subsidy. And Mr. President is part of that fraud, I'm sorry to say, because he's the Minister for Petroleum. So you cannot absolve Mr. President. He's the Minister for Petroleum. All right, uh, Obunabo, uh, interesting one there. Let's uh, take uh, one or two more just uh, before we wrap up. Let's talk about Nigeria energy transition. You know, there's a story there on The Guardian, just on the red strip. It says uh, Nigeria's energy transition mad by debt, subsidies, and stranded oil. I know we just talked about, uh, you know, uh, petrol subsidy, but then the, the federal government seems to believe they can do more, you know, with um, gas this time around. I think we have been disconnected. Uh, we hope that Okunabo joins us shortly before we call it a wrap this morning on Off the Press. Mm. But yeah, uh, you know, some of the issues that you have raised or the questions and concerns that you have raised are very valid. Mm. And uh, for me, I think that this probably will not be the first time we're having conversations. You just said it over and over so again. So we, 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 we always have this conversation. I mean, these stories still make it to the front pages. We keep talking Every about Every other time. Issue. And I feel like we're going in circle as a nation because it's like there's so much talking and nothing, you know, has, been done. nothing has been done. To, to the other end, you begin to ask, is it that we're not in the know of what's going on? Those of course we know be, exactly. We feel so, it every So what day. Then exactly is the issue? Is it that we lack the Because capacity? some people are actually benefiting from all of this anomalies. So, but in a system, because if we say this is a system, then the system should be able you know, to purge itself of all of this sort of impunity. Mm -hmm. That's what it should be. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a democratic dispensation because every other time on television or any other, you know, platform, 
uh, it, it begins to sound sound like we're uh, helpless people, like <laughs> because that's what it is. It's like, oh, uh, you know, it's this is what's going on. There's really nothing that we can do, and so we say, hey, because Mercy, we, we it's, need it's, to. It's a situation to, like I'm uh, being sick. Yeah, you know, you're sick, and. Uh, Doctors have actually told you what to take, the drugs you're supposed to take, but you know that if you uh, took those drugs, uh, you'd be better off for it, but then you are not taking those drugs. So it means that you're not ready to change. We heard that Open Abor is back. Open Abor, thanks for uh, joining us again. Open Abor, are you with us? Yes, hello. All hello. right, just uh, before uh, we lost you, we're, talking about, we're still talking about um, Nigeria's um, energy. Uh, there's a story on um, The Guardian. It says a Nigeria's energy transition mired by debt, subsidies, and stranded oil. Uh, this is in the wake of when almost all economies are talking about um, green energy, uh, but we are uh, renewable energy. But here we're still talking about, like you just mentioned, petrol subsidy and the issues of um, gas and kerosene. Do you really think that uh, this? Uh, federal government's policy of uh, trying to make so much out of gas would actually see the light of day. Do we still have him? I think we have um, lost um, open a ball. <laughs> Not like lost him. <laughs> we got, <laughs> we got uh, disconnected. We, we, we've been again. disconnected. Mm. But you know, another issue that we'll yeah. be looking at because our current economy. Uh, we say that we've been grappling with revenue. Revenue seems to be the major issue. Mm. And for some people, when you begin to look at state government, they say, oh, uh, if you look at how much a certain state has collected in terms of allocation, it's not mm. enough you know, to run the government. Mm. Now, that, that might be a very valid point. Because they, should look they should look internally there. But you, but you know another question that we have, another thing that's big on us is, I, have, I haven't seen a government, I haven't seen any country that has... Uh, you know, say we have enough. <laughs> you know, yes. I enough. haven't seen any country that said, hey, we have been allocated. There's a country that comes to say, oh, a certain sector has, has gotten enough allocation or the mm. budget is enough. Because I know that, you know, uh, the want of human beings or human needs the can essential. never be, uh, you know, met. So the more you have, we, we can never get to a point where we say we have enough resource yeah, we or resources or enough funds, as mm. it were. But the big question is, with the little that we have, with the little that has been allocated to different sectors, with the little that the state governors what are done with you know, receiving, whether it's been reduced from the center, from mm -hmm. all earnings, how far have we fed with it? How far have we managed this resources? What results have we you know, been able to achieve? Let's mm -hmm. look at how we have been able to allocate these resources to the benefit of the people, and we, we hope to see, you know, infrastructural development and what have you, because that will be the essence of it. So, yes, it, it, it goes beyond saying we're not we earning enough. enough. We have a revenue challenge, but the little that you're earning. What have you resource, done with it? What have you done with remember, it? The, remember the parable of um, um, the, the, the might? <laughs> we were going back to church. <laughs> no, but then those parables that, uh, that were told to us, uh, they actually have impactful, you know, substance. Uh, even to this um, very age, uh, you were given one. Um, one talent, or the, or the parable of the talent that is, you were given one talent, you were given two, you were given several, you know, but you went to hide or consume or defraud your own state and say that, uh, come out to say that uh, you, you're not given enough. But then, like you validly said, the little that you have, what have you done with it? If you are faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. So it also goes to the fact that uh, uh, most states' government should actually look beyond uh, uh, going cap in hand to the federal government or FAC every month to get allocations, everything. What have you been able to do from your own state? Lagos uh, is always used as, um, uh, as an example when it comes to internally generated revenue, even as much as they still get allocation from the federal government. They make a lot. I, I was uh, privileged to attend um, a 30-year plan that the Lagos state government, you know, outlined sometime last year. They are actually making plans for 2053 Mercy. They have plans on projected revenue, and it's not just about what they are going to get from the federal government. They are making the most of um, investment from the private sector, international community, and uh, even taxation. And they have plans of um, airports and other things, but they're going to be funded not from the state government's coffers, but from individuals. You know, it's a private public partnership, and you don't have to go every month begging, as it were, 
for allocation from no, no, the, no, so, but, from the but, central. You know, but if, if, if we look at it in that case, we talk about the issue of subsidy, mm. and we have heard that subsidy is a scam. Uh, even this administration has, was not in support of subsidy. Mm -hmm. And they say <laughs> anything about but they've subsidy. They've been subsidizing us. <laughs> so <laughs> and they brought up the up this year for subsidy. Say never. Mm -hmm. So we have been talking about subsidy. Who is subsidizing? Should we subsidize? At what point should we subsidize? We're subsidizing uh, corruption. Why should we subsidize in the first <laughs> instance? And if we say we're taking out subsidy, what should we have in place, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that um, everything moves smoothly? Why don't we have our refineries functioning? What business do we still have importing Good petrol pro we have no uh, business. products, you know? In so, I mean, th there's a lot, and it's really depressing. Uh, to say the least to say very very depressing yeah, really now that we hear lot. that you know our revenue has increased uh, all earnings we have improved for the past three months is that a plus for us what exactly are we doing do when we, we, still do we have when we still have um, you know high cost of governance uh, you know in the news the national assembly you know do you see almost they are budgeting for their severance no, package no why not why not <laughs> and and it's really saddening because every other time justin this is not new because if you also look at how much we allocate to mm. capital spending and recurrent expenditure we mm. that we always uh, chunk our resources, right. you know, to the cost of running governance. And that's not very productive because for every nation that wants to get it right, it's expected that you spend see how capital. much you spend on capital because that's how you get to the point of development. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a break now and when we return, we'll be looking at more critical issues right here on The Breakfast. Please stay with us.